So good evening, everybody. It's my pleasure. Uh, this is Faz uh, al again to see you uh, under the GIS educational uh, programs. Uh, uh, after we finish our first wave of, uh, of uh, uh, education, including for interventional cardiology and technician and nurses, uh, this is again uh, uh, time for more uh, uh, special things. We're going to do today uh, e-workshop talking about uh, rotablation, mainly the new device uh, Rotabro with the help and support of Boston Scientific uh, Company. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to have a, a senior in this field. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Edis. He's an assistant professor of cardiology, interventional cardiology and head of cat lab in Simi Lewis uh, University, Hungary. We have Dr. Khaled al Merri, senior interventional cardiology and chest disease hospital from Kuwait. And I'm gonna share this um, uh, uh, webinar and workshop along with my friend, Dr. Abdullah Shihab, uh, professor of cardiovascular and, and internal medicine, uh, UA and senior interventional cardiology, and we work together in, in GIS. Uh, so it's uh, my pleasure uh, uh, to have you all. It's going to be a, a workshop. So we have two presentation. During the presentation, we're going to uh, post some MCQs for you. You can go uh, live and answer it, and definitely the speaker will comment on your answer and, and, and take it from there. Uh, please uh, uh, feel free. Uh, to send your question along uh, presentations uh, and, and the, after each presentation we'll go some discussion and definitely we'll try to handle your question uh, as you go. So, Dr. Edis, it's your time now. Thank you very much for the very kind um, words and invitation. It's my distinct honor to be here from Central Europe um, at your esteemed um, educational meeting. And please allow me to share my slides. If everything is okay then Right now you'll be able to see them. And now in presentation mode. Okay, so what I would like to talk about is the algorithm that we use in Budapest, Hungary to assess and approach a severely calcified coronary lesion. And hopefully by the end of my talk, you'll get a sense of how we do it here in Hungary. <clears throat> I work at the Samovas University Heart and Vascular Center. What you have to know that this is a tertiary university hospital. It uh, has been active for almost uh, 100 years now, starting in 1922. It is situated in Central Europe, um, in beautiful Hungary, in the capital in Budapest. It has a large amount of beds with lots of ICU and sub-ICU beds. We have a full range of vascular um, <clears throat> people here, cardiologists, vascular surgeons, and of course, uh, cardiothoracic surgeons. Uh, our interventional cardiology department uh, has 14 doctors, six of them seniors. We handle ACS cases 24-7. We are also the national and mainly only center in Hungary for mechanical circulatory support. We have all kinds of board and expertise also with this. And thus we are also the shock center for uh, the region of Budapest and uh, the surrounding, which is about 3 million people. We do about 3,500 PCIs per, per year on two plus two tables. We have two tables always working. Um, and we have been a rotablation proctor institution for 17 years now at our uh, institution. And we've had trainees from all over the world, from Japan to China, Australia, um, Argentina, the USA, everywhere. Hungary is situated right here. Uh, and that is now in the middle of Budapest, where I am right now and where our institution is. Now to the fact of the matter, why am I here? Coronary artery disease, especially uh, the kind uh, that we think is benign, is uh, usually uh, in conjunction with calcification. If we see calcium in the coronary arteries, then we might think that this is a benign form of coronary artery disease because the calcified lesion gives us, gives us the impression that these are stable nodules within the coronary artery and they seldom cause real cardiac events leading to uh, acute coronary syndromes or anything worse than, uh, let's say, a typical angina. Yet one has to mention that a form of ACS involves uh, the rupture of these vascularized calcified nodules inside the, inside the uh, plaque and uh, thus creating an ACS. And the residual lumen is, of course, in this case, is much smaller than uh, compared to the classical flatty plaque rupture of an acute coronary syndrome, which may prove a headache for us interventional cardiologists. Thus, we can call this not benign, but an end-stage coronary artery disease where um, spontaneous healing and uh, spontaneous well-being of the patient uh, with this coronary status is very unlikely. 
It is also difficult to treat coronary disease. Why? Because coronary calcification is usually extensive. It involves numerous coronary segments. It's extremely difficult to manipulate and is usually resistant to classical PCI methods. It's sticky and, it, and it's breaky. People who have an uh, interventional cardiologist who have handled uh, lesions such as this know exactly what sticky and breaky mean. We are, uh, try to avoid both uh, with our new methods. So then, what are the available options that we can do because these patients do require treatment? Now, um, first thing that uh, I have to mention, and it's very important, that if native coronary artery calcification is visible on the angiogram, then thorough lesion preparation is a must. It is required. The choice of devices that uh, we are, are going to use for the preparation uh, depends on a multitude of factors and often requires more than one method. We'll also get to this later on. And the general idea for the region prep is the following. Only consider advancing your coronary stent inside the coronary artery if you're absolutely convinced that first of all, you can deliver it. And second of all, you can successfully and safely deploy it. So how to start then? Um, Classical predilation or predilatation that's usually used um, in regions that are not severely calcified or are simply tight, but uh, need to be first loosened up for, the, for you to be able to um, approach it with the stent. Um, this usually fails in calcific lesions. And why? This is um, one of the two factors that you can see here, or in worst case scenario, both. One is so-called BTF, which is balloon transmission failure when you fail to advance even your smallest balloon through the lesion. The other one is BEF, balloon expansion failure, or the classical so-called hourglass phenomenon, when you are able to pass your balloon through the lesion, but if you inflate it, you get your uh, very classical hourglass shape, and um, the lesion itself does not bulge or does not budge, even to 30 plus atmospheres or even 40 atmospheres um, of pressure. If you see one of the two, then use of dedicated devices is absolutely indicated. The rotational laterectomy system that I will talk about uh, in detail is indicated for both of them, both BTF and BEF. Cutting balloon microtomes or the um, uh, intravascular lithotripsy machine are, in are indicated for expansion failure. And there's also the orbital laterectomy system and the laser laterectomy system. Uh, of these two, I do not have uh, too much experience with. The orbital atherectomy does not have a C mark yet, so I was unable to use it. The razor atherectomy, I've only used once. Now, a few thoughts about the microtomes and the IVL, just to uh, get a few thoughts moving. I'm happy to say that the first uh, coronary microtome that is uh, also uh, called, uh, called the old one, Flextome, which is a product of Boston Scientific, it was invented by a Hungarian man in 1993, which I'm very proud of. And uh, eventually, uh, the new iteration of this uh, device is called the Wolverine uh, coronary cutting balloon, which you can see in the top right corner of the slide. Um, I've had the chance to use it, and uh, it's the most modern microtome uh, available at, on the market today, almost with a casting profile of a classic uh, non-combined balloon. The shockwave balloon, um, which is um, the technology that uh, we borrowed from the urologists, um, uses shock waves inside the fluid, usually saline, and uh, with this it creates micro fractures within uh, the diseased calcified coronary wall to allow for further manipulation. I've used this multiple times. It's a very bulky uh, device. It's uh, difficult to advance in the lesion, and about 80% of the cases requires what uh, atherectomy before advancing this balloon. And probably the best known device and the most widely used and my favorite, that is of course the so-called drilling or buzzing of the plaque via rotational atherectomy. Now the question always arises and as a proctor for rotational atherectomy, uh, the case and the most common question I get is, when do we use rotational atherectomy and how do we use rotational atherectomy? Both cases, both questions are absolutely important and uh, albeit difficult to answer. There was the old era answer when the old era when answer was consider rotational atherectomy all the time if you think that rotational atherectomy is needed. So if you see an interventional cardiologist who already has performed multiple number of rotational atherectomies and upon just eyeballing uh, the coronary angiogram thinks that this is needed, then absolutely this should be undertaken and this still works about 80% of the time. Yet, the modern era is imaging, which means that um, with imaging available, we have another asset in our inventory with which uh, we can do some more. 
And right now, this will be my first question. I'd like to ask the audience and the panel, what do they consider to be the primary use in calcified coronary lesions, IBIS or OCT? And please submit your answer. We'll wait a couple of seconds for the answers to come in. Yes, we have a 72% IBIS versus 28% OCT. That's almost a three quarter majority for IBIS. I also have to agree. Main reasons are that the IBIS itself, uh, the crossing profile of the IBIS itself is smaller. Uh, both the Boston Scientific Council and the Volcano Council that I am familiar with. And um, um, it does not require um, the additional contrast material flush uh, which in this case is uh, important. Now, I also have um, a slight and, uh, but basically uh, not too difficult to follow algorithm here on how to assess uh, a calcified uh, coronary lesion. How we do it in Budapest in Hungary is the following. If we see that there is evident calcification on the angiogram and on the lesion that we'd like to treat, we determine IVUS characteristics beforehand. Now, if we encounter a no-cross of the IBIS uh, transducer or the lesion is evidently very tight, then we rotablate up front. And then we do the IBIS after the initial rotablation. And um, I like to uh, keep things very easy, very straightforward in my cath lab. So what we do is uh, we look for the calcium arch. If it's 180 degrees or upwards, we definitely rotablate. If it does not reach 180 degrees, and the calcification is moderate, then um, rotablation is not, ne not always necessary, but either after severe um, and large degree arch uh, after rotablation or with a moderate arch and without rotablation, we always additionally prepare the lesion either with uh, NC balloons, uh, OPN, uh, very high pressure NC balloons, microtomes, or in dedicated cases, IVLs, we apply the stents as needed, and absolutely important, we always IBUS optimize the stent. Uh, if you needed to rotablate the patient, then you're not sure uh, what your result is after stent implantation, only if you visualize. When you implant the stent into a large bulk of calcium, even with modern stent boosting techniques on your C-arm and your NGO machine, you do not get an optimal picture, only if you look inside the vessel with the IBUS. What to do the rotablation with? On the left of the, of the slide, you see the classical uh, rotablator or so-called Rotalink Plus legacy system. This has given us 30 years of dedicated, extremely stable and reliable service. It is pretty cheap. Uh, downside is that it has a definite two-man requirement with either two operators or one operator and one nurse. On the right, you see the evolved new uh, 21st century iteration of the device. This is the so-called Rotopro system. I've had the luck and the honor to use the Rotopro system for uh, quite some time now, over a year. I've done over 50 procedures with it and I absolutely love the system. It has evolved from the uh, later, uh, from the prior version. It does not have the pedal anymore, which is, was a real nuisance. You can see that it is a semi-automatic system and uh, the generator itself is now digital, handling almost everything uh, by itself. And it is a one operator system requirement and no second doctor and no nurse is required. Uh, and the next question, has anybody used this Rotopro system before? So who has experience with this Rotopro? Can we see the system, the answers please? <clears throat> so the questions better said, sorry. We'll wait a bit for the answers to come in. Also, ease of use with the new Rotopro system is much better. I see that um, it's exactly one, uh, one uh, quarter to three quarters, 25% of the 
uh, people who have answered the question has already used this. I'm definitely sure that also these people are much to their liking and to the other 70%, I wish them uh, for them to get the system as fast as possible and try it out because trust me, you will love it. <clears throat> now let's go on. And a few tips and tricks. I also, the next proctoring question that I often get is who should rotablate and what are the results? Do we have evidence? Um, we published in 2015 in uh, CCI, so catheterization and cardiovascular interventions, our data for really high risk mortality patients undergoing rotational laterectomy. And um, what we have uh, to facet is the following, that a senior and experienced interventional cardiologist is required to do the rotarization of laterectomy. So this is not for trainees and not for residents. Um, a doctor should perform it who has received dedicated training from a specialist, uh, either in their institution or somewhere else, somewhere else. And depending on lab volume, a maximum of two or three operators per institution is, is enough, even for the biggest center. Uh, we at our center with 3,500 PCIs per year and two tables, we have two senior operators and one uh, operator who is still in training. The, que the question is a bit uh, too early, please. So please exit out because this will be this will come in a couple of minutes. And uh, I also recommend the proctor involvement for the additional 10 or 20 cases if you are new to rotational laterectomy. Our success rate in Budapest, Hungary is about is over 90% and the uh, long-term results are acceptable uh, for basically every patient. And uh, the also uh, important, what happens or when do I need to ask an absolute pro uh, in this case? Okay, one, I'll memorize this and we'll get back to this a little bit later for this work question. <clears throat> Now the question was, um, when do we need to ask a tertiary center for help? Usually when you need a left main rotablation, so that's where the absolute uh, specialists need to be involved, is, um, exactly. And uh, especially if, if bifurcation lesions are involved. With decreased left ventricular function, which is usually on top of the prior one, especially when mechanical circulatory support is considered, and in bailout situations where you have a destroyed stent, and the stent ablation is necessary. We're also able to publish a very nice article in your intervention about this. We had 20, upwards of 20 patients that required stent ablation, and we gave our clinical perspective and the recommendation using uh, the high speed rotational laterectomy for these uh, patients. Now, uh, concerning the wires, we have the floppy wire and the extra support wire. The floppy wire does the trick in 90% of the cases especially where wire escalation uh, proves uh, difficult, then a pathfinder standard wire may be uh, applied. And if need be, it can also be changed with a microcatheter. Uh, this image that we see right here with a double S curve of an extremely calcified proximal LAD is uh, a prime example for the first uh, wiring with um, uh, pathfinder wire and then either changing it with a microcatheter or um, placing your rotor wire besides the already placed pathfinder. And the burr, this was the question that already uh, was answered, was which is your standard? I also have to agree with the one that of the answer they received. I also like to start with the 1.5 burr. And the 1.5 millimeter burr is optimal in 80% of the cases to begin with. Uh, I recommend using um, uh, mid RPM, so 130, 40 to 150, 60 K per minute, and uh, do a maximum burr run of 15 to 20 seconds. As there is a lot of friction, you will need to wait for the blood to cool it and wait as much as you uh, as you uh, ablate it. So if you ablate it for 15 seconds, then count uh, slowly to 15 after you've uh, stopped with ablation and then go again. If you do not penetrate the lesion after four to five runs, increase your speed to the system's maximum of 200K and try again two or three times. If there is still no penetration, that's when you need to downsize uh, your equipment. This happens in about 30, 20 to 30 percent of the cases, as I as uh, shown in my practice. For the handling of the bird, there are two methods. There's the pecking and the hammering. Pecking you see on the left side. This is the one where the bird is advanced um, in a much calmer fashion uh, with your hand not doing too big of a movements on the button. Um, usually, this is for um, for your initial problems. Uh, hammering method is when you. Uh, 
penetrating the lesion proves difficult, you have to up the RPM, and you still want to get through the lesion without downsizing, then hammering may be considered, but I myself do not uh, really use it, and I do not even recommend it. Since to, uh, 2015, we have a European expert consensus on rotational atherectomy, and they say about the, the same thing, that the pecking sh technique should be used, start with small bursts, preferably 1.5, and use mid-RPMs from 140 to 160K. Also, what you have to really watch is the so-called Kokashi phenomenon, or the bur entrapment, when the bur jumps over the lesion without effectively ablating it, and you have an extremely difficult time of getting it out. There are plus points for the rotoplow in this case because it warns you. When the RPM drops with, um, with a, with, uh, um, between 1,000 to, uh, to 5,000 RPMs, you get a hollow yellow square right there, and it's absolutely visible when you're doing atherectomy. And if it falls more than 5,000 RPMs, then you get a yellow square and a warning sign that the stall is imminent and to not over push your burr. This is extremely helpful, and uh, this is, was uh, one of the um, new things on the device that uh, helped my uh, everyday practice a lot. So uh, if I want to tell you what I think of rotational atherectomy in the 21st century, that's the following. Rotational atherectomy uh, is living its real second renaissance. Um, since now it's uh, done mainly as a lesion uh, preparing tool and uh, that's how we use it. Um, many old co uh, and polycomorbid patients may be treated. Rotational atherectomy is often the only option to help a patient, and uh, the new Rotopro system is absolutely state of the art 21st century, and everyone who uses it, especially people who have experience with the legacy system, uh, will see that it's uh, immensely superior and much more user friendly and much more fun, I have to uh, put it this way. And considering these elderly polycomorbid patients, um, you have to say that if you do not have the option to rotablate, you cannot stand the patient, which means you cannot revascularize the patients, which means you cannot save the patient. And when you have this system, you have the potential for saving lives that are lost otherwise. Dedicated training and proctoring is albeit needed because uh, the system does require some getting used to. And um, you have to do multiple things at the same time, and you have to know where your hands and your eyes need, need to be uh, at given and certain time points. But in experienced hands, it is a safe and effective way to treat uh, otherwise incurable uh, pathologies. I don't want to get too much into the cases. I will just show you one that we have, which is a very typical case. This is a 66-year-old woman with typical angina who was diagnosed in another cath lab and having a proximal LAD stenosis. Um, you can see the native calcification on the LAD right here in the proximal part. You can see that I was unable to advance uh, the guide through the radial artery, so we had to go femoral. We did the IVUS as per um, um, our guidelines, and we saw nodules of calcium in the box, in the distal LAD or mid LAD, and um, uh, uh, 180 degree arch right here of uh, calcium in the proximal LAD. First, we did the rotational atherectomy. It uh, slid through the proximal part and only uh, ablated uh, the mid part of the, of the LAD, as was uh, planned. And after the IVUS uh, of the uh, rotablation, we saw that the LAD and D1 bifurcation was debulked, but the proximal LAD was basically unchanged following rotapro treatment, which was not too much of a surprise because I used the 1.5, and as you can see, this is way bigger. So. I had the opportunity, and this was the first time that I was able to use the Wolverine microtome. Um, I had no problems whatsoever advancing the microtome into the lesion, and I also did an IVUS after the microtome, and I had a very, very nice image. This is how the same part of the coronary artery looked uh, after microtome um, manipulation. You can see the two fracture points where the blades of the microtomes were and it magnificently fractured uh, this heavy calcium burden in the artery, and uh, stenting with two stents was effortless afterwards, and uh, we achieved quite a nice result, and you can, as you can see up, uh, on the top of the angio, and as you can see on the bottom, we have uh, the IVUS, where we see a nicely deployed stent, no opposition, uh, with a good uh, lumen gain. And uh, for my last slide, this is the sunset at uh, Lake Balaton and in summer in Western Hungary. You can see my contact info in the bottom right. Uh, it would be my honor uh, to invite 
everyone to Hungary when um, the situation allows us. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. This is a great presentation. You went over the uh, how to handle calcification, a very nice case, and, uh, and the new system of Protobro. Uh, so uh, before I go to a question, I will just allow Dr. Abdullah Shihab to have any comment on the, on the presentations. Outstanding, Dr. Edis, uh, for this, I think, you know, uh, fundamental of, you know, handling the atherectomy, and you dealt with actually everything, how to modify the, you know, the lesions. I mean, we all agree that the calcification is the enemy, you know, the most challenging for all of the interventionists. And the prevalence of moderate to severe, as you said, is 30%, and the severe one is 10%, which really, you know, make us, you know, wonder and how to manage our cases, especially with the new generation we have now, the stent available, if we don't prepare our lesion properly, which you've, you know, you showed us through the angiography, tell us, you know, the, how, how we can tell about the amount of calcification, but then we have intravascular imaging, which is really fundamental to know the arc, to know the thickness, to know the length, so we know what appropriate uh, methodology to use for debulking. I think, you know, um, th this is focus, as Dr. Fawaz said, today is on arthro, you know, rot rotablation, you know, but we have many uh, modalities to do this, but, uh, you know, we should, you know, sometimes we use them all together. You know, we use the starting from the balloons to the, you know, as you said, um, shock wave, and then, yes. uh, Arthro, you know, the, the rotabilization. My question is to Dr. Edis. You know, uh, people are, you know, sometimes wonder, uh, there are some lesions like angulated or the innocent, you know, what, what should we do with that? You know, some people, you know, some guidelines says, you know, it's contraindicated. I mean, do we have any way to, to overcome this? Yes, um, when I was a resident, um, I mentioned many things to my professor, Professor Mackley, and uh, what he said is, um, Contraindicated are usually things that some people have not there tried yet. And I have to agree with this because um, um, we've had many, many very difficult cases of um, fractured, destroyed, crippled stents inside proximal LEDs of young men aged 50 uh, to 60 with no option for surgery. Um, and what we did is we revved up the machine and we chiseled the metal and it was doable. Angulation is not a problem. So if you are able to advance the wire uh, within the vessel and you are absolutely sure you are inside the vessel, and despite angulation, feel free to rotablate because as the burr um, nears the angulation, there's all, uh, always a shock wave before the burr that is generated from the spinning motion. So this is physics. And that by itself will ease the angulation. And uh, do not fear, you will have no, no trouble uh, in this regard. Great. Yeah, if I can comment for a couple of things. Sure, you can. Uh, Dr. Edis, this is really great uh, presentation, reflects a great and big experience with rotablation. Um, <clears throat> just if we go back to the rotablating stent, um, the problem with it is yes, it will shave the stent, but there's a very high risk that you can entrap your bear into the stent. Uh, and sure. that's the major thing, the, the, the bear can get entrapped in the stent. Uh, the other thing is, is in, in, in angulated vessels, and I had one patient. So the problem with that is not only the angulation and direction of the, of the uh, uh, rotablation, it's just even when you ablate, it, you will, the uh, rotablation will follow the wire bias. So it will ablate into one wall, and when you balloon, you can rupture the vessel. That's it, true. It happened yes. with me uh, in the past. So when you have a, a wire into the vessel at a bend, so the rotablation, instead of going into the center of the lesion, will just ablate the side of the lesion, making the wall of the vessel thin. So when you balloon, so yeah, you may not have a perforation after the rotablation, well, you will have it after the ballooning. Um, uh, rotablating a stent, it should be done by really, really experienced people like Dr. Edis, not for people who are just starting the rota, rota, No, 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 rota definitely program. not. Okay. Uh, the other thing is when we talked about the imaging. So yes, IVIS is a great tool, easy tool, quick, no contrast. And when you have a complex calcified lesion and you stand, you want to do pre and post, if you use OCT, you'll give lots of contrast. Yeah. But the OCT has an advantage over the IVIS that it can tell you how uh, big is the, the calcium, how bulky is it? So it will show you 
after the lumen, how much calcium behind that calcium. So if you find a big uh, uh, chunky calcium, you know your rotablation will not be enough. So you need another modality. You need to break that. So if I do OCT and find a big bulk of calcium uh, in the vessel, I know that if, even if I go with a big burr, it will not be enough. I, will, I need something that can break that chunk of calcium. So that can change your modality. But I agree with you. The, the one that we use commonly in those complex cases is IVIS. Usually it is enough. Usually it can be most of the, the, the uh, information. But OCT has an advantage in, over that. I have to agree. Um, if, if you, um, so if you are planning to use OCT, then um, as in some dedicated and extremely difficult places, for example, that you want to see now um, where we did rotational atherectomy of stents on the stent ablation, uh, we also try to um, apply the OCT and look at it uh, in that direction. If you want to do an, IC, uh, an OCT, I recommend using it in conjunction with the IVUS, so not by itself, and only after stent implantation. So um, if you've implanted your stent, then uh, if you have the funds, if you have everything, uh, then and uh, the OCT at hand, then do the OCT because it's much better at identifying uh, the real strats of the stent versus uh, the native calcification of the coronary artery. So with that, the OCT is much, uh, much better because it has a much better resolution. And um, even tiny parts of malaposition inside the stent are visible uh, with the OCT that the IVUS may even miss. Dr. Edis, even before, if you see bulky calcium, you would choose different mod modality. I, I would choose, in that case, bulky calcium. I would use the shockwave to break it or even vocational atherectomy because it, don't, it doesn't only shave the calcium, but push the calcium away and can break it. So you can choose your modality. Uh, uh, yeah. If you allow, if you allow me, Dr. Edis, uh, if you allow me, Dr. Edis, just for a second. Yes. Yeah, just since, because if, we may have a lot of uh, points that can be answered by Dr. Khaled Al-Murray in his presentation. I'll just go over two questions quickly to uh, handling to, to you. Then we'll move on to the next presentation. Then anything missing with the presentation, we'll handle it at the end. So one of the, uh, our audience asked about uh, what is your approach in bear, uh, entrapment? What you, what's your advice and what you should do? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. It's an extremely difficult one to answer. Um, um, I'll just say a few words. If you want to look at it um, in detail, please refer to the European consensus on rotational atherectomy, which I am showing right now. Now, there are multiple ways to handle this. First one is the one that's easiest, you pull on it. If you see that the burr has stalled, then pull it. If you use the 1.5 or 1.25 burr, you have about a 60 to 70% of ch uh, chance that if you pull it, not extremely hard, but hard enough, everything will jump out. This will include the wire and the guide and everything, but if you're lucky, it will come out. Now, other thing, uh, if you have a real problem, if you cannot pull it out like this, um, the other option that you have is introducing another guide, another wire, and a very small balloon, which you put um, right beside the burr and inflate it. And just uh, push it a bit distal to the burr and inflate it right there. 1.5 or 1.2, 1.25 balloon. And if you're lucky, this will push the burr uh, into a proximal direction and, and, and then it's out. If both of these modalities fail, then uh, you're in a really difficult situation because then you have to uh, call the heart surgeon. Uh, from my, let's see, it's been um, 15 years since I've been doing rotational atherectomy. I've had um, about 20 burr jams, so 20 um, times when um, the burr jammed and I was on it, and it, I had a very, very difficult time to remove it. And an additional about 40 to 50 where I simply pulled it and it came out. And out of these 20, two patients were the only one that needed uh, definite heart surgery to remove uh, the interventional devices. With the others, after an hour or two or three or four, I was able, I, I managed to get, get him out with multiple attempts at ballooning and popping it out, pulling, ballooning, popping it out, pulling, but eventually it worked. Okay, great. So uh, for the audience, I promise to answer all the questions uh, for the sake of time and like to, to move to the next uh, presentation. Most of it, uh, uh, which it will answer your question. Otherwise, we'll go, go over it at the end. So, Dr. Khaled, please, if you start your presentation.
Um, thank you again for involving me in this session. Um, it's really excited to, to be with you today. I'm going to, basically my presentation is around a case. So I'm going to show a case uh, that we had with severe calcification and just we go over the evidence and how to treat it. Um, in short, our patient is 77 years old uh, who is presenting with heart failure symptoms. He's presenting with shortness of breath, class three, uh, and uh, he is hypertensive, he's on dialysis, um, had history of PCI in 2007. I'm not sure which vessel was stented, there was no details. Um, and his echo showed severe LV dysfunction with mild to moderate aortic stenosis. This is his current angiography. He has left dominant system, and you can see the amount of calcium in the coronary uh, uh, artery three, in the ascending aorta, in the aortic valve. You can see the um, calcium in the left main, proximal LAD circumflex artery. And once you see the calcium uh, in uh, both phases with, or uh, during angiography, uh, that means this is severe calcification. And this is another view uh, that shows the eccentric calcified stenosis of the left main and the LAD and the circumflex artery. You see, I see a shadow there into the circumflex artery uh, I'm not sure that's the stent or calcium. And here is, I can show you the um, calcification in the, how bad is it in the ascending aorta and the coronary tree. Um, so when we looked at this patient, he's basically Medina class one, one, one. And um, Medina classification um, has some short uh, uh, coming. So has some, it's not really absolutely telling you about the nature of the bifurcation. And we just heard about a new classification that could be a better one, which can uh, tell you about the, if there is trifurcation or not, which Medina doesn't cover it. And the other thing tell you about the size of the vessel. So basically this classification tell you how big is the vessels and whether you have a ramus intermediate branch involved or not. And the other advantage of this classification, it doesn't depend on Korean geography, but, all, but also uh, if, you have, if you have positive FFR or IVUS, it can be as, as a, a evaluation of the, for the stenosis. So our patient is basically uh, ABC, means uh, capital A, uh, left main more than 3.5, LAD, which is B, more than 3.5, and a circumflex artery more than 3.5, and there is no ramus intermediate branch. So this patient was referred for surgery, and the surgeon labeled him as high risk. And if you go by the STS score, it doesn't tell you, so it tell you about a percentage, but there are things that not taken in consideration in this patient, which is the, like the amount of calcium in the ascending aorta. He has porcelain aorta, which is risky for a stroke. So after discussing the risk with the patient, with the surgeon, uh, PCI was decided. The, that procedure was done in a different institution and he was referred to us. Um, the problem with, the, with, the, with this PCI, it's basically there is heavy calcification. And we know calcification uh, can be a problem in uh, balloon dilatation, can prevent you from delivering your stent to the lesion. Even if you reach the lesion, it can prevent the drug of drug looting stent from delivering it to the tissue underneath it. It can disrupt the uh, polymer. And even if you're successful with your stent there, it may not be expanded properly. And also it's been known that the calcium give you a smaller minimal luminal diameter means it give you a, a, a smaller acute gain. The other problem with calcium with angiography, if you look to the second column, is even if you have calcium, two to three quadrants, you, are, uh, uh, you can miss 60% of the calcium in those patients. You can only identify calcification in 40% if you have three, two to three quadrants involved. So you can miss it easily, you can underestimate it by angiography unless you do imaging. The other thing with the calcium is not only making your technical uh, steps difficult, it's also increase your outcome. So it increases the uh, uh, mortality of the patient having severe calcification, 
increase the risk of an eye, stent thrombosis, and revascularization. And even in the drug eluting stent era, having severe calcification is a predictor of higher risk of death, MI, and revascularization in, uh, compared to patients with no severe calcification. Um, we talked about this. So in this patient, in our patient here, the options, we have severe calcification of the left main, LAD, and circumflex RT. The option is to go with a balloon uh, dilatation or use a cutting balloon or scoring balloon or go with high pressure balloons like OPNs or use shock waves, uh, which is the newcomer, or go with debulking a thyrectomy like rotational or, or orbital. My question to you, to the audience, my question to the audience, this patient in your institution, what would you start with? Not ideally, in your institution. Please let's see what, what's the practice in your institutions. That's, that's really impressive that 45% will start with rotablation. So I think we have an experienced group tonight. Uh, but still we have less than, uh, more than 50% they will start with ballooning or cutting balloon. So my next question is uh, because of, we know the rotablation rate is about one to 5%, less than 10%. T to the people that they, uh, don't use commonly rotablation, although it is available, what prevents them from using rotablation up front? Is it because they think it is a riskier tool, because the evidence is not there, or because it takes long time to prepare and to do, or because of the costs? cost and safety. Um, okay, let's go over those um, issues. If we talk about the evidence, do we have safety first? So this is a road taxes trial, which they compared PTCA with drug eluting stent, stent compared to uh, rotablation with drug eluting stent. And actually, Rotablation does not increase your risk of procedural complications compared to your uh, usual balloon angioplasty, which is against what most of the people think. If I use this drill, it will increase my risk. Actually, it doesn't, of course, in experienced hand. On the other side, it will increase your, uh, your success rate compared to balloon angioplasty. So you have, you have a tool that will increase your success rate with no higher risk of complications. And again, if we look to the um, a study looked into, if you see calcium, you just use upfront rotablation, or you do, you do it as provisional, which means you balloon, if the lesion doesn't heal, then you go with rotablation. And it was found, if you go with upfront rotablation, your procedural time is shorter. So it doesn't really consume time if you take in consideration the complexity of the lesions. Also, the contrast was used less in people that used upfront rotablation, and fluoroscopy time is less. And about data, well, we have very good data that using rotablation give you bigger stent expansion area. So um, we don't have an outcome data regarding death, MIs, that's better than balloon angioplasty, but we know uh, under expanded stents, are predictors or as predictor of MIs and restenosis. And we have very good evidence that rotablation give you bigger stent expansion and a bigger acute gain and uh, luminal area. And the other point I want to talk about rotablation, now there is a standard technique that we use in rotablation. Everybody's almost, everybody's doing this technique. It's the time, uh, uh, size of the bear to artery ratio. Uh, it should be uh, up to 0.6, the speed, the way that we advance it, the duration, and deceleration time. 
all those steps, techniques are, are compared to different techniques and different studies. So they came out of certain studies. They looked into different techniques. At the end, they came up with this optimal technique. Uh, like an example, the bare artery size ratio was tried this 0.6 or one, one to one. And they found if you use one to one, there is no more gain, but more complications. And the same for the speed. So whatever techniques we are using, which is exactly what's in the table, came out of lots of trials, lots of, of a comparison to different techniques. And rotablation, although that some people may say, well, we don't have outcome data. It's in the guidelines, class 2A, and, 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 and calcified and crossable lesions. And even in the ESC, it's the same thing. It is there for uncrossable lesions. So you have the evidence, you have the data, you have the safety, and you have the tool that will, will make your life easier. We'll go back to my patient. We'll go back to my patient. Basically, we tried IVUS to size and evaluate the calcification, but the IVUS was not going through. So we decided to make a space for the, for the uh, uh, IVUS and I took 2.5 balloon, and you can see, once I use that balloon, it ruptured. Then you know, no other device will go through this. No uh, cutting balloon, no OPM balloon, no shockwave will go through this. You have to make a space. So my decision after this is to go and do rotablation. So what we did is we uh, used a micro catheter into the LAD, um, and go with a floppy wire, our uh, BMW wire down into the uh, LAD, then exchange it with rotor floppy wire. And then I started with 1.5 bird. Uh, using 1.5 or 1.25 um, or bigger bears, if you use bigger bore, you're, bear, you're running the risk of having more risk of no reflow. And you have more risk of uh, bear entrapment especially if you use the hammering technique, which I don't like, as, as Dr. Edis said, uh, he doesn't like that. And I also doesn't like this. If you use a hammering technique, you can entrap your uh, burr easily. So I started with 1.5 burr, and we did multiple runs. This is one of them. And we have to um, uh, stress on the picking technique, picking technique. And once you cross, you do the last polishing. And this is our last polishing. So after doing this, I went after the circumflex artery. So basically, I didn't have a running uh, video for that. Um, so I took the BMW wire down into the circumflex artery over a micro catheter and exchanged it with a floppy wire. Two points I need to talk about this thing here. If you look to the still image, I will never ablate with this direction, never to do that because of the angle. So if you ablate that way, you can just cut your wire and go straight ahead. You have to be coaxial with the artery. So what we did is we pulled it up and make it coaxial to the direction of the cirque and did our uh, rotablation. Uh, unfortunately, we did it under floor, which is not safe. So I don't have it there. But we did rotablation to the circumflex artery. The other thing, sometimes you have a bifurcation, the side branch is valuable. So you might occlude it when you do rotablation. Is there any way to protect it? Either you use something that you can protect your side branch, different uh, tool, or once you want to see, uh, do rotablation, you have to go with a bigger guide, like size eight. You can put, let's say this, you want to protect the cirque, you put your floppy wire in, cover it with a micro cutter like fine cross, and then do your rotablation left main LAD. I have not done it myself. I'm not sure if Dr. Edis has done it, but uh, it's been reported. Um, so once we did rotablation to the cirque, guess what? The bear got stuck to the ostium with the circumflex artery. It was difficult to get it back. So to remind you about the bear, it has diamond at the tip, but there are no diamond in the back. So it does not ablate backward. So it gets stuck because of that. I wonder why not they put it all through. This is a question to Boston guys. So now how to deal with that is basically, as Dr. Edis said, once you get your uh, uh, bear interrupt, you pull it hard. If it doesn't come with you, you go from the other side 
and wire beside it, balloon, and try to get it out. If it doesn't work, you dismantle the, the uh, rotor. So what you do is you cut the drive, which is the, the, uh, the uh, uh, metal shaft. And then you take the plastic over it. You can see there's a plastic over it there. Take it out and then go with a guide liner or guide extension guide until you reach the, the uh, uh, micro, uh, the uh, rotor burr and pull it inside it. If that doesn't work, so you have to go for surgery. Those are the tips and tricks that you could use. Just reinforce it, Dr. Edis went through it nicely. So after we did rotablation, before, before the uh, ballooning, we did IBIS. So you can see the proximal LED has almost uh, half of it is uh, calcium evolving 180 degrees. Osteal is, uh, just remember that the size of the lumen now is after rotablation. That lumen we will not be able to cross with an IBIS. And you can see in the distal left main is almost circumferential. And osteal uh, uh, circumflex artery and distal circum. Uh, circa. Uh, lesion. After that, we took a, oh, we'll talk about imaging. Maybe that's the time to talk about imaging. Should we do imaging to left main PCIs? The answer, yes. It will tell you about you need to prepare the lesion, It'll tell you about the size of your equipment you need. It will tell you about the length of the lesion, tell you after you deploy your stent, the expansion, is it, is it optimal? And if you have any complications. And uh, this is a paper from UK. They found the usage of IVIS has gone up in the recent years. And the uh, point out of this is they found as the uh, usage of IVIS in unprotected left may increase, the risk of uh, death or mortality has gone down up more than one third. The Nobel trial, they looked into the IVIS group. They found people who had IVIS guided PCI in Nobel, they had less restenosis. And especially those are, they ended up by bigger left male lumen. And the uh, biggest data that we have from meta-analysis that using IVIS into left main PCI decreased the risk of MACE uh, and cardiac death or MIs and even stent thrombosis. And IVIS is class 2A in the guidelines. So after using IVIS, we did uh, um, um, aggressive ballooning to the left main LAD and circumflex artery. You can see there a 3-5 balloon into the LAD, and you can see another one into the circumflex artery. You can see the balloon after rotablation opening nicely. The previous balloon was rupturing into the LAD. And this is the circumflex artery. Again, the balloon is opening nicely there. And this is IVIS after ballooning. So you can see the calcium has uh, 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 crack there and a crack here. Do you see my pointer? Or you don't? Yes, yes, we do. Yeah, yes. And then we'll just run a short run of the calcium. This is proximal LED, by the way. And you can see more, more cracks there. And you can see more cracks there. And you can see something called reverberation. Reverberation, you can see like lines in the, in the sub sub or underneath the calcium, usually we see it after rotablation, means the calcium became thinner. So reverberation is a good sign. Then we decide to stent, and we decide to use culotte technique. So we took a 4-0 stent and deployed it from left main to the circumflex artery. And you can see here the stent is opening nicely. And this is in a calcified, severely calcified lesion, you wouldn't imagine that unless uh, uh, um, with debulking. And then the other trick here, if you look to the previous one, um, the other trick here is um, to go through the struts into the LAD. We went, we jailed the wire into the LAD. So we went with a twin pass over the wire of the circumflex artery and rewire the LAD. So make sure that we don't go beneath the strut. After that, we open the strut nicely, and then we deployed a 4030 stent. So this is the positioning of the stent. And before we deploy it in kilot, we pull the wire of the circumflex artery. And again, to rewire the circumflex artery, we go with the same twin pass 
over the wire of the LED and go into the circ. No chance to go underneath the struts. And then uh, we open the struts here. And then we, we went with a 4-0 NC balloons on both vessels, alternate high, uh, high uh, pressures, then uh, um, kissing balloon with 4-0 balloons. And as recommended to everybody that you should finish with a pot. This is a 408. And this is our final result. So you can see the stent are well expanded. Um, and this is from another view. Then we ended up by IBIS. You can see the size of the stent in the proximal LED, very well expanded, well opposed, left main, osteal circ, and you can see the bifurcation there nicely in LED circumflex artery. And that result could not have been uh, achieved without debulking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khaled. This is what's called the uh, perfectionism and in, in, in the, the presentation and the case. It, it's a very, very, very difficult uh, case, very calcific, and, and you did a great job. Actually, I completely forget about the, the topic of presentation and just enjoy how you <laughs> handle, how you handle the, the, uh, the case. It's an amazing uh, final result. Uh, you demonstrated nicely with the, how uh, rotor, uh, rotation uh, or uh, rotablation work uh, here. Uh, you did a lot of tools um, and final result is amazing as usual. Um, excellent. Uh, before we move on to the uh, uh, question, maybe I'll allow Dr. Abdullah Shahab, if you have any comment, then I'll come back and just read the audience questions. Outstanding, uh, Dr. Khaled. You know, um, when you come to, uh, do, you, do you hear me? Yes. I can't, I can't see your uh, faces. So uh, it's outstanding, I think, the case. It's a typical case, Dr. Fawaz, Dr. Khaled, you know, the, in our region. Elderly, diabetic, and in the stage renal failure, the calcification you see is like a stint. Um, and I think, you know, um, the imaging was, you know, showed the, 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 how, how benefit the, 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 the evidence, you know, the, the imaging and really um, make you to use the best strategy for handling this kind of uh, lesion. Um, you did uh, what we do normally, we go with the balloon and um, <laughs> then you, you, you know, we went uh, ahead and, and you mentioned, you know, uh, the, the calcification and the benefit of that on, on term of maize and, uh, you know, the mortality, which is, uh, which is great. But we don't know yet, you know, if, the, if, if by using the rotabulation has got, you know, outcome in term of, um, we're still waiting for that, of course. But um, the guidelines, you nicely showed 2A, which is, should, uh, you know, stimulate everyone to use the, 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 the rotabulation. So outstanding uh, case, Dr. Khalid. Great, good. Uh, before we move to a question, Dr. Khaled, we were uh, talking about uh, uh, IVAS versus uh, uh, OCT, um, and uh, what's your approach when you see an, an, uh, the calcification OCT, is it 360 or, or 180 or more than 180? So can you comment on this, then I'll go over the audio question. I think Dr. Edis said it nicely. If you have more than uh, 180, definitely you have to do that circumflexion. Definitely you have to do that. Less than 90, you may get away with non-rotablation uh, tools. Um, yeah. Great. In, fact, in my experience, I see that if it's less than 180, you have a very good chance of getting by without rotablation uh, using other dedicated devices. So, for example, the microtones are the ones that, that I really like, or, or simple scoring balloons. For example, the grip balloon, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, that's a very nice device uh, that can be utilized in this. Excellent uh, presentation, Dr. Khaled. I, I myself also enjoyed it very much. I would have done one, one thing differently uh, in this case. Uh, the first balloon that you advanced um, into the LAD, which ruptured, um, did the patient uh, have any problems with this? Because um, concerning low ejection fraction and uh, critical coronary status, this may even lead the patient into shock afterwards, uh, requiring resuscitation. So I would have upfront uh, gone for a rotational atherectomy when I was unable to advance, uh, or if I am unable to advance uh, an imaging catheter. Yeah, yeah, I used 2.5, just to make a room for the IBIS. It's not really to dilate and prepare the lesion. So that balloon was, was not for dilatation of the balloon, but I agree with you 
ruptured balloon can cause dissection. Uh, I didn't expect that was ruptured. So well, no reflow. Uh, just to make a trace. That, that's basically it. I, I wasn't preparing the lesion with that balloon. Let's see. Okay. Great. Thank so doctor, uh, this uh, question from Dr. Faisal Goff, he said, when do you reach for a shock wave balloon versus a rotation atherectomy? Do you think the shock wave give bigger stint uh, area compared to a rotation atherectomy? No, not necessarily. Um, I think that you, the two uh, devices need to be used in conjunction. So uh, one does not um, go for the other. So it, it's not an if if question, it's an and question. So. Um, we use the, so my first problem with the shockwave balloon is that uh, the coronary version of the shockwave uh, balloon only has 80 pulses, which means that you can do one pulse. So if you start doing it, then 10 pulses um, are let out of the system in one, which means you can do this eight times, uh, which is not too much. Uh, so the fact of the matter is that uh, we use it uh, when the calcification is really, really extreme for one. And uh, even after rotoblating uh, and on a control angio and on a control ibis, you see, still see that uh, the calcium is not cracked enough. The images that Dr. Khaled showed, uh, showed uh, very nicely when you can see the fracture um, of the, um, the arch itself. And uh, in, in this case, uh, the shockwave is, is a good option. The other problem with the shockwave that I myself have experienced, I've only done about 10 cases, so I do not have that much experience with it, is it's extremely bulky. So it's very difficult to navigate into a calcific lesion, especially if you do not, uh, if you fail to do upfront rotational atherectomy. On the plus side for the shockwave balloon, if you are successful uh, with the, the shockwave ballooning um, of a certain point, then expansion of the, of the stand is effortless. So, after um, you did a shockwave balloon, and uh, according to the IFU of the device, you have to use the same size of the balloon that you, uh, for the um, stent that you wish to implant. So if you are successful with shockwaving the lesion, you do not even have to do uh, NC ballooning afterwards. You are free to advance your stent and open it. And in the cases uh, in which I did that, I had uh, no trouble whatsoever opening uh, the device, the stent, I mean. And uh, we had very nice intravascular imaging afterwards. I don't know, Dr. Khaled, if you have any uh, information or any experience in this. Yeah, um, uh, shockwaves, uh, to choose between shockwave and rotablation, there are, if you have deep calcium, you can start with, uh, with shockwaves. It will be better than rotablation, I, I believe. The other thing, if you have a big vessel, so the, the residual lumen is bigger than your rota burr. So in, in those cases, so you know that if you go with a rotor, you will not get much uh, results. So you go with a balloon, uh, which is big vessels. Those are the two other situations. I would start with shockwave, uh, not the rotablation. Great. But as so, you said, it is bulky. Sometimes you need rotablation to make the room for the shockwave balloon. Yeah. That's all taking me to the next question for you, Dr. Khaled. Uh, when not to use rotablation calcific lesion? That's a nice question. Yeah, I can't think of any except if there is any dissection that, um, so th th there are things that you, you should not use. One, if you have smaller vessel, so you should not rotablate a smaller vessel. Um, two, um, if you have really bends and angles, you, sh you should not do that. Um, uh, three, in acute MI or thrombus, you should not do rotablation if there is a clot. Um, Four, um, as we said, if there is a, any bad dissection, uh, you should not rot do rotablation. Khaled, in the eccentric uh, lesion calcified, how do you manage that? I think rotablation is, is, is a good tool to use for eccentric lesions. So uh, because the shock wave will not work, because it, it will not break that, um, and even orbital atherectomy will not work, but I think the rotablation is the ideal for this. I don't know about Dr. Edis, what do you think? Yes, I agree. Um, I can think of one more um, anatomical position where you do not ro use rotational atherectomy, and that's in, in very old venous grafts. So very old saphenous venous grafts, which are also calcified, uh, are tempting, but uh, you must not do it because uh, they, they fracture and they break very easily and they perforate. Right, yeah, because one question about the vein graft, what does you think, uh, I think it's, you, you answer it. Uh, 
uh, the catheter extension. So the other question here is that with the angulation, uh, how to handle it? I think you already both mentioned it, but maybe maybe Dr. Edis just one one uh, uh, one minute and comment on that because it's very important in the rotablation. Angulation, lesion, and lung. What is your approach? Um, in terms of uh, what angulation um, does the question refer to? So the guide, guiding catheter inside the coronary artery or the lesion itself? So the distal part of the, the coronary the artery where the itself. water is. The lesion itself is so angulated. The lesion itself, I, I see. Now, um, as, as Dr. Khaled um, uh, very elegantly put it, uh, the device itself um, has a wire bias. This is a very nice term which I'm going to use. So thank you very much for this. Um, and um, um, I myself d did not luckily have any uh, problems uh, in the past with, with angulated vessels. Of course, um, if you see a very, very angulated vessel, as you see in uh, elderly, uh, frail diabetic women, usually, uh, which are like a corkscrew, uh, there I would not consider uh, doing rotational atherectomy. But um, if the bend is not too big, meaning uh, that um, you see that the wire um, with a high resolution image, you see that the wire is, is more or less uh, in the middle part uh, of the vessel itself, and uh, not really angulated to either proximal or uh, medial or lateral sides uh, of the coronary artery, then uh, I do not think that um, it's, it's too much of an issue. And uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the rotoblur itself, when it's spinning at maximum speed, it does have a trend um, to relieve the angulation when it nears uh, the area of interest. So, uh, for us, maybe if I yeah. ask one about angulation, because you know one of the contraindications, as you know, experts again yourself, you you are very expert in this. You can do this. So the what about this halfway rotabulation? You know, uh, halfway you just do it, then do the rest by balloon. Then you continue with rotabulation, as being uh, published by the colleagues from Korea. I mean, they have a series of this halfway rotabulation balloon. Yes, I, I'm familiar with it. Um, and so. Uh, this what we use sometimes in CTOs. If we have very long CTOs, that's how um, uh, we use it sometimes. I only have limited experience with this because these are extremely long procedures. Uh, to be honest, they require multiple guide changes, lots of contrast material and everything. And uh, we have the ambulance knocking on our, on our door with uh, acute MI patients. So I've only done a couple, maybe two or three uh, out of these, but uh, my, uh, the original results were not bad. The only thing was that uh, it took a lot of man hours and manpower to perform. Great. Uh, Dr. Khaled and Dr. Edis, what is the difference in, um, with the new system, uh, Rotobro? Uh, just take us th through it. And I think you, Dr. Edis already pointed to, uh, before we go on uh, live, that it's, it's completely like a new car, an old car. Uh, so yes, yes, yes. So um, if I may, I'd be happy to answer this question because sure. I'm very excited about the new, new uh, machine. Now, uh, first of all, and most important, the pedal is not there. So you do not have a pedal. Um, you turn the machine on by the knob uh, with which you advance the burr, that has a button on top of it on the new system and you push that to, uh, to turn it on. So that's analogous with stepping on the burr. Now, uh, the Dynaglide function is also totally different on the end uh, of the system itself. So we usually call it rocket because that's how it, uh, it's shaped. So on the, on the end of the rocket, um, on the nurse's end of the rocket, there is the Dynaglide button. And when you, it lights up green if, uh, if it's on and it's, it does not light on if it's uh, off. The nurse is the one that um, puts uh, the uh, Dynaglide function um, on and off uh, as compared to the other uh, where you also have to push the pedal and the small adjuster switch to the right of the pedal. Uh, meaning that uh, the nurse uh, pushes the button, which is uh, the Dynaglide, and then simultaneously picks up uh, the whole system and with the index finger and thumb pushes two buttons. One is the on button and the other is the brake uh, release. And that's how the system is advanced on uh, the wire itself. If you do not have a nurse, it's also a one man job. So you can first go to the system, advance it. I saw this um, from Dr. Milos Ferenc. I don't know if anybody knows him. He's a German guy uh, who works in the Schwarzwald. And uh, he's the one that I first saw using this system about uh, two years ago. He's a, a dear colleague of mine. And uh, he did this all by himself, uh, escalated wire by himself. And he said, OK, look here. And then uh, he picked up the system, pushed the buttons, and in about three seconds, um, the bird was there at the point of interest. Then he put the whole thing down, uh, pushed another button, um, started um, the 
high power version and did that. And um, besides this, the other main difference is that um, the console is now digital. It sets the burst speed automatically to 160,000 uh, with nothing that you need to do. You don't need to test it as you had to do with the legacy machine. And connecting the system is extremely easy now because there are three points of connectors in the front of the system. And um, it's a no mess up. So one connection can only go in one slot. So there is no chance that you can set it up uh, incorrectly. And um, the other thing that I uh, partly mentioned, uh, which is a safety feature, uh, if the burst starts to stall and the RPM falls, um, starts falling below 1,000, uh, you get a hollow yellow triangle. If it goes below uh, 5,000, you get a, a whole yellow triangle showing that the um, RPM speed is decreasing and the thing starts beeping. So you know when you're in the critical position and that's when you know you have to stop advancing the burr or else you'll get a stall. So these are the main difference I see. I also have to mention that the burr itself, so the head, the, uh, that's the same as with the legacy system. And uh, one more thing, Dr. Khaled uh, had a question on uh, why the proximal part of the burr, uh, burr shaft is not moving. Actually, I was in Ireland in Cork uh, at the Boston Scientific Manufacturing Plant and took a look at this and I asked this myself because this is very annoying. And they said uh, that this is due to the manufacturing process that uh, these are two separate, uh, the, these things are made of two separate materials and then joined together as one. And um, physically and due to engineering issues, they cannot make it out of one piece for the whole thing to rotate. That's what they told Fantastic. me. Fantastic, nice to know that. Yeah. Do you have any comment on uh, uh, Rotabro? No, we don't have it. We had it uh, as a demo. We haven't, I haven't used it on a patient. Great. I think you almost, almost handled most of the questions. Uh, you did the, both, you did a great job. Um, I think it's a, you cover it uh, uh, so nicely. So uh, in the next five minutes, we'll just go over uh, the final uh, closing remarks and everyone is, is welcome to, to share the final thoughts and some messages to our audience. So start Dr. Abdullah Shahab. Now, I think, you know, Dr. Fawaz, you know, th this kind of workshop, which you've, mashallah, you've greatly uh, selected the right people, I think, to start with because people want to see the complex made simple. And I think, you know, you guys, Dr. Khaled, Dr. Edis, you make really the classification, which is, I say, it is an enemy, made it really simple for us how to use rota relation, you know, in, in a right way and, and using the imaging and, you know, how to handle it in, in, a, in, a, how to, in, a, in a practical way, step by step. And, and I'm sure, we you know, with the, with the prevalence of increasing classification in our region, post, uh, you know, uh, cabbage and, uh, you know, uh, and the stage renal failure, so we need to be ready for this. And I think, inshallah, a series of these meetings will make us you know, ready for that. Great. Dr. Edes, kindly. Yes, thank you very much again for the invitation. It was an honor to be um, among such experts as yourselves. Um, I would like to say that um, if I even manage to convince only one attendee that rotational atherectomy is safe and effective and good for your patient, then I say the workshop uh, was a success. Great. Dr. Khaled? Uh, I would like to thank you for those sessions. Those are very uh, uh, exciting to participate in, and I think we need it um, for the re region, and it's easily accessible now with these virtual meetings. And I, I, uh, I agree with Dr. Edis. If we come out of this session that rotablation is safe, don't get afraid of it, I think we got the message through. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for all of you in this uh, uh, nice presentation and Dr. Abdullah Shahab, nice comments. Um, I think it's, we cover a, a very important topic today, how to handle calcification. Again, it's, uh, as Dr. Abdullah mentioned, it's uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, problems in the cath lab. Uh, today, you demonstrate to us that there is an, a new um, uh, system. Uh, uh, people say rotablation is an old technology, has a lot of things in the cath lab. It says, well, uh, uh, give you more time uh, to work with it. Nowadays, you have a, a new uh, uh, system that is uh, user friendly. You can use it and uh, demonstrated by Dr. Khaled that it's safe, uh, doesn't extend your time, so it's, it's faster and it can save your patient and give you better result. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so it's, you have a tool that you should use it in the cath lab. And if you didn't know how to use it, the company will provide you with the, with the proctor that can help you. Um, I think it's a very important uh, education today. Uh, hopefully it will be delivered to our audience in the cath lab and, and uh, materialize it in a form that you use it more in your patient. 
and we all aim that to, to save lives and, and decrease complication and have better outcome in our cath lab. Uh, I cannot thank you enough. Uh, you did a great job today in this uh, uh, webinar and, and uh, e-workshop. Uh, thank you very much for Boston Scientific for their support and I appreciate all the audience today um, and I, uh, we hopefully that we deliver whatever you expect from us to do tonight. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you, gentlemen. Bye.